Well, just a few days ago, we saw the second in the row of Elon Musk's spectacular failures with the Starship. It accomplished none of its objectives of getting into orbit, bringing the booster back. Like the first mission, it ended with the explosion of the booster and the and the second stage Starship not getting into orbit. And if we have any more failures like this, we'll be on we'll be on our way to Mars in about four years. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle here with Steve Green and Scott Ott. And this episode is not so much about the fact that Starship. Uh, went further than the previous one. It's not even so much about the fact that the mission is undoubtedly a success. If for no other reason, than it didn't make the same mistakes that the first one did. They didn't end up blowing up their own launch pad because they created too much power and bouncing debris back in the engines. They got past max Q. The main reason that the second uh, mission was a successful failure was because none of the mistakes on the first mission were repeated and we got to learn some new ones. When I did the Apollo 11 uh, What We Saw series, guys, back in uh, 2019, I realized that the reason that so many people don't believe the, the moon landing occurred is because it's presented as if the moon landing just parachuted out of hmm. the sky, that, that we just simply got a rocket and went to the moon and that's it, that, that Apollo 11 was the first manned spaceflight ever, <laughs> and, 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 and that's why they don't believe it. The thing I tried to do in that series was show that incrementalism is the way to success. Apollo 11 didn't do anything drastically more difficult than Apollo 10. Apollo 10 didn't do anything drastically more difficult than Apollo 9 or 8 or 7 or Gemini missions or the Mercury missions or, 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 or the V2 or bottle rockets. It's all just a spectrum. So um, I think this life lesson is so important. I just want to come to it again. Steve. Failure is how we learn things. We, there are, there are in any new technology like this, like the Starship, there are any numbers of bugs that are built into the system that we don't know about because we gave it our best shot, but we're not perfect. Reality is going to interfere with our engineering plans. And the only way to get this into a successful, reliable vehicle is to learn what those mistakes are. And so by learning what those mistakes are, this is a gigantic success. It's an enormous success. And anybody who says that this mission was a failure is an idiot. You have to fail your way to success. Or, or a liar. I'll get to that in a moment if I, if I could make a mental note. You know, I, I don't know in what context I was thinking about this, but it was just earlier today. There's a really cute line from Robert Heinlein, Stranger in a Strange Land, where Michael Valentine Smith, a man who was raised by Martians, had never seen a human being in his life, when he comes to Earth, is having to learn all of our ways from scratch. And on one of his first days on Earth, he discovers uh, there are actually two ways of tying your shoes. One is good for walking, and the other is good for lying down. And that's this is kind of where we are when it comes to, to Starship. Uh, you got to learn these lessons. Um, in fact, From the Earth to the Moon, which HBO put out, might be almost 20 years ago now. It's one of my favorite miniseries, yeah. and it... it it covers that part of the space race from Earth to the moon. Um, and in an early episode, first or second episode, when Kennedy is given the the, the direction, we are going to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. A NASA guy, I can't remember if it was an engineer, if it was flight director, what's his name, but he gets the chalkboard, he gets in front of the chalkboard, he says, okay, these are the steps we have to take. Basically, these are the f different flights we have to do to learn the lessons we need to get this man on the moon. Um, and then NASA went and did all of these things in the space of about eight years. It was a, it was, it, it was a miracle. Lessons learned every step of the way. What impresses me most about Elon Musk is not just that he had this amazing, successful test flight on Saturday, but that he upped the difficulty level when he didn't have to. Uh, in between the first flight in, in April, which we covered live, it was on a weekday and it was amazing, um, he decided, you know what, I can get 10% more mass into orbit, not just on this flight, but forever with Starship, Ever. if we do hot staging. And yeah. hot staging, the Russians do this a lot with their rockets. Hot staging, as I'm sure you know, is when you light off the second stage while the first stage is still going strong and you get extra boost because the first stage is still lifting you when you hot stage the second one. And he decided, you know what? Screw it. We're going to try hot staging in the second test flight. The first flight blew up after two minutes or whatever it was. We're just now we're, we're, we're up in the difficulty level because hot staging is going to make a real difference in how much mass I can get to orbit. And it worked. 
it's not just that the rocket, the second rocket flew uh, higher and further than the first rocket. It's that he upped the difficulty level with this hot staging and it worked. And it worked. And it worked. So, uh, yeah, I would have been really excited to, to, to see everything work 100% and, and land the first stage and, and get the second stage all the way to Hawaii. Didn't happen. But what did happen worked. And it, it, it took me right back to, to NASA in the early 60s and that willingness to risk it and to know what lessons you need to learn before you fail so that when you fail, you do learn those lessons. And we're watching it happen in real time. I'm so impressed. Scotty, I have this theory, and I'm not alone in this. Most, uh, most engineers, in fact, understand this. But my basic theory is, and I'm sure Elon Musk understands this, is that you're going to have to blow up a certain number of rockets to get it right. And the thing that's so frustrating about watching what's been happening with SpaceX, we did a show back in April, and I think it was your segment, Scott, where he said he's made like a thousand changes to the to the uh, vehicle, and he did it in five weeks. So basically, Elon Musk was ready to fly end of May. Certainly by June, he was ready to fly. He didn't get a chance to fly till November. Because the government is is slowing him down. They have a rival program that they'll, that'll never catch him, but they're slowing him down on purpose. They're hobbling him. And the reason this is a problem, is, Scott, is because, as I say, there are certain bugs in the system, and you're going to have to blow up enough rockets to get all of those things fixed. If you're going to do that, if you believe that's true, and it is, then... What you want to do is you want to have your failure cycle as quickly as possible so that you can get the bugs out of the system and not take a half a century to do it. And so this is the problem for me is not that the rocket blew up. It's that he's got another seven rockets or whatever is going to have to explode. Why can't we get them all done in three months and start going to Mars? Exactly. Uh, first of all, I, I happened to uh, catch the launch live. I just come back from my morning walk and it the rocket had just taken off when I clicked onto the live stream on YouTube. So it was perfect timing. Um, and let me say a couple of things. First of all, um, we're doing Academy Awards for rocket launches. Uh, best on-screen telemetry to date. They were actually showing on the screen this time the attitude of the booster and the, and the main rocket. And so you could actually see and the, and the number of engines that were yes, there, too, yes. which was cool. So, oh, that's true. That that was awesome as well. Um, so so best on-screen telemetry for the viewer be, to be able to, to watch this. Uh, and number two, uh, best launch images I've ever seen. I mean, the view of those, uh, what is it, 33 rocket engines on the main booster going up there, mm -hmm. just just glorious pictures there. And uh, and this ought to be like the best motion picture award here. This is the best award of the night. Best explosion ever. I mean, this is <laughs> this explosion. I swear, it looked like something Hollywood did because, like, debris was flying past the camera, or so it seemed. I don't. It was in an almost perfect vacuum. It was nothing to slow the explosion it was just down. Unbelievable. It was no drag. Yeah. So basically, when you're doing something like this, uh, and and by the way, after I watched the launch, and I was. Ebullient. I was list I was still the cheers of the people at the space center were still ringing in my ears as I went in and took a shower and then listened to the NPR reporter tell me how Elon Musk had failed again, and I was just like, "Oh my goodness, were you people watching this? Didn't you see any of this? This was amazing." Um, th wh what you have in this kind of an endeavor is basically three things: you've got hardware, you've got software, and you've got data. What they just generated was a bunch of data about the hardware and the software so that the next time they're going to make another thousand changes, no doubt, where they're going to go in and tweak the hardware. as And, and that's kind of the smallest part of it, really. The hardware tweaking is probably not the major work. It's the software tweaking that's the major work. And they're going to adjust the software um, and make some adjustments to the hardware so that the next launch, they generate more data. You want a massive trove of data that shows what works and more importantly, what doesn't work. I mean, the, it's sad to say this, but the, the best thing that came out of the Columbia disintegration in the atmosphere was the data about foam coming off a rocket that takes off that could possibly strike a wing and, and punch a hole in it where hot plasma could later flow in and destabilize the craft. So there, every experience you have when you actually launch provides data. And this 
not only, this is not only about rockets. This should be a lesson that they should teach every week in school. This is, yes. this is my Because point. life is about getting data. And the only way you can get data is by launching. And if you only ever talk about launching and dream about launching and even draw pictures of launching, you're not launching. All of that stuff is called not launching. And when you don't launch, you don't get data, you get theories. So while the whole media world and political chat class and even some of Musk's competitors are are discussing theories, he's launching and gathering data. And may he do it with ever increasing speed. Uh, yeah. You know, I have to tell you that the, the, this uh, understanding that we're going to fail our way to success is so deeply embedded in SpaceX that when you heard the real time, uh, just, you know, the, the real time announcement of the rocket as it's going up, when the thing exploded, it there was no, oh, and, and no pause. It, there was, the thing exploded, and, and I think the woman said, well, it looks like we just had an RUD, yep. <laughs> which is a rapid, unscheduled uh, yep. uh, disassembly. Uh, disassembly. Yeah, yeah, it's just, yep, yeah, well, had an RUD. Okay, that's kind of fun. And, <laughs> and they got and more this of them lined up, succeed. ready to go. Of course they do. Of course they do. And, and I hope the government will understand, look, it gets, it, it, it's not going to hit Florida, okay? Uh, so, so get out of the way. We'll see about that. But the point I wanted to make is, is this. We are going to fail our way to Mars. That's how it's going to work because this is, this is not a failure. Donald Rumsfeld got knocked for being an idiot when he actually said, voiced, wasn't he came up with it, but it, he voiced what was really brilliant insight yeah. into the problem of, of engineering and life. And he says, look, we have known knowns or things that we know we have known unknowns. There are things that we don't know, but we know what they are. We just don't know what the, what the, what the quantity yet is. And we have unknown unknowns, meaning there are bugs that we are unaware of completely hiding in, and we, there's no way to predict them. There's no way to mitigate them until they show up. And this is why you have to blow up a certain number of rockets. And frankly, I was going to say, if you got it right the first time, I'd be very suspicious. Yes. But through some miracle, through some absolute genuine miracle, the Saturn V rocket, I think, flew 13 times without a failure ever. It never once had a problem. But that's because they were building on so much incremental use of engines and technologies that you could probably make a case for that. Uh, the vehicle got through Max-Q. It got through the area of greatest dynamic uh, air pressure, um, aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. That means that the structure sound... As Steve pointed out, the hot staging work. And for those of you who are just still a little bit confused about this, if you look back on the video that you probably remember as, as kids of the Apollo 11 staging, if you look at the video that was on the, on the, um, this very famous shot on the second stage, you would see this first stage would just fall away. And then the, and then the docking ring, you know, would, would kind of fall away and tumble. It would take a while. And then that second stage will ignite. Well, all of that time, 10 seconds, something like that. You're not getting any thrust. You're slowing down. Your vehicle is slowing down. You're not going faster. You're slowing down. Gravity's pulling you down. You got to get that back before you can, before you can gain again. So yes, it's difficult. The main problem with hot staging is how do you make sure that you don't have the booster smack into the back end of the second stage once the booster has lost all of its front end weight? Well, it turns out they did that too. So, it's nothing but success, but the reason I wanted to do it was not just once again to, 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 to crow about SpaceX as SpaceX as a rocket company. It was to crow about SpaceX as a, as a pattern for living, as a, as a yes. way to succeed that is not limited to rocket flight. It's not limited to electric cars. Every single one of us should have this in our bones from childhood that failure is your friend. The only the only thing about failure that you should fear or, 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 or be on your guard against is if you make a mistake, just make sure you don't make that mistake again. You can make new mistakes that way. You can find out what the unknown unknowns are. But the fundamental issue of, of SpaceX's success was, was, uh, was said by Elon Musk, what, 15, 10 years ago, eight years ago or something? There's a very famous line from Apollo 13 where, where uh, Gene Krantz says, failure is not an option. Failure is not an option because we've got three human beings we have to bring back to Earth. But somewhere quite a while ago, Musk said, you're at SpaceX, failure is definitely an option. 
That's confidence. Putting together a video showing every single one of the explosions that you had on the Falcon rocket until you got it right, boom, 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 means that you understand how to get through life. So this is for all of us out there, but especially you kids. Failing is how you succeed. And and as 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 um as Michael Jordan did in that incredible ad, he just lists all the free shots he missed, all the game winning shots he missed, all of the times he he ran over, all of the failures that he made. I fail and fail and fail, and that is why I succeed. So congratulations on your latest failure, SpaceX. It was uh it was spectacular. Uh I, I hope that there are as few rockets as possible that need to be blown up. But when you have this attitude, you're going to Mars. We're going to fail our way right to Mars. And if the government would just get out of his way, we'll not only live to see it, we'll live to, well, we'll probably live to see the first child born on Mars and probably going to be a direct descendant of Elon Musk knowing Elon <laughs> Musk. For, for uh, Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time here on Right Angle.